Um, for those of you who have been here before, some of the names are familiar, welcome back. For those of you who have not, um, we are the Marine Environmental Education Center located out on Hollywood Beach, Florida. Um, we are still closed to the public, but we want to keep everyone engaged, uh, keep working with the community and provide some really cool online resources since a lot of people are also stuck inside uh, looking for new things to do. Um, so we have started this cool webinar series. We have our August schedule out right now. If you check on any of our socials, you'll be able to find it. Um, we are making our September schedule. So if you know any friends that would be interested in presenting, give us a call. Um, otherwise, today we are lucky enough to be working with Broward County's Stephanie Kedzuf. Um, Broward County has a bunch of really cool beach and marine programs. Um, and we are learning how to help protect our vital resources, including our dunes, our coral reefs, our sea turtles, all the things that we really talk about and really care about um, here at the Meek. So we are going to keep everyone muted for now, um, just because it makes it so much easier for you to hear Stephanie talk. Um, if you have any questions, or even if you're having technical issues, throw that into the group chat. She will answer them at the end. Um, and Christina and I are both here to monitor that group chat. Uh, and make sure that everyone is doing all right. Uh, so whenever you are ready, Stephanie, please take it away. Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for hosting. I'm really excited to be a part of your webinar series. I really appreciate the invite. And thank you to all of you who have tuned in this afternoon. Um, you know, I'm really excited to talk to you about some of our beach and marine resource programs. Um, so again, my name is Stephanie Kedzeff. I'm a natural resource specialist with Broward County. Um, just so you know a little bit of my background, I've been at the county for about four years. Um, I do have a background in marine biology. I did my undergrad in South Carolina, and then I came down to Florida for um, graduate school, and I went to FAU for that. Um, so I've been working specifically with sea turtles. That's my main responsibility at the county, uh, but I also assist with a lot of our other programs that I'm going to talk to you about today, like our beaches, um, and some of our offshore resources as well, um, since everything is kind of connected. So without further ado, here are Broward County's beach and marine resources. So the first program I'd like to introduce you to is our beach management program. This program is responsible for ensuring that there's adequate sand on our beautiful beaches. Our beaches are important for many different reasons, and the first one is our local economy. Um, people visit Florida and especially Broward County for our beaches. In fact, the beaches in Florida actually attract more people than theme parks, which I thought was kind of crazy when I first heard that statistic. Um, and you can see um, last year we did have over 131 million people visiting Florida um, and a lot of those people come to the beaches. And on average, our beaches actually produce $8.5 billion annually in economic activity, which is also crazy to think about. Um, so the next example of why our beaches are important is because they provide critical habitat for a lot of critters, uh, including sea turtles, shorebirds and seabirds, and also vegetation. Uh, lastly, our beaches are important to protect upland infrastructure, such as roads, buildings, and homes from damage due to storms and hurricanes. So, Let's look at an example of um, what can happen if a storm came through an area where the beach maybe wasn't too wide and didn't have resilient vegetation. So some of you might remember this, um, this you know, real example of Superstorm Sandy. And let's just say that she won the battle against Fort Lauderdale back in 2012. Um, so these are just a couple photos of A1A. Uh, this is not the intercoastal <laughs> or a random river in Florida. This is A1A. Um, you can see, I hope you can see my mouse here. So this was um, a bunch of salt water and sand that washed onto A1A after Sandy came through our area. Um, so she did a lot of damage. Um, the beaches in this area were not very built up. They didn't have dunes to make them more resilient. So the beach just came right into the road um, along with a lot of, like I said, salt water and sand. Um, so to prevent things like this from happening in the future, um, the county builds beaches that are wide with resilient vegetation like dunes. And so we'll talk more about dunes a little bit later, but that's why the county, uh, that's another part of, part of why the county maintains our beaches the way that we do. 
So one question that we get asked a lot is where does the sand for these beach projects come from? Um, well, traditionally, uh, renourishment projects in Broward County used offshore sand. And the way that works is that a large vessel um, that's located offshore, just like the one in this photo here, um, they pump sand through um, from designated areas through pipes and onto the beach. But this method has a lot more potential for impacts to our habitat offshore and on the beach. Um, so we have these big pipes that are laid like this one here and they literally just squirt sand onto the beach. Um, and the sand also tends to be a little bit gray and really coarse, um, which really isn't ideal mm -hmm. for our tourists. They don't like the gray colored sand. And it's also not so great for our wildlife. Um, we've realized that through some studies um, over the years. So more recently, Broward County has used upland sourced sand for its beach projects instead. So this sand is actually dug up from mines located inshore. Um, it's trucked to the site and then dumped onto the beach. And I have a couple of videos that I'd like to show you and I'm crossing my fingers that they'll work. Um, so this is a video of our trucks um, driving to the site. Um, so essentially we have a bunch of different staging locations um, along the beach as we do these projects and the trucks full of sand drive up to the designated access point and they get directed um, by employees at the site and they follow a very specific route um, through the site so that they can get in, dump the sand in their truck and then go back out kind of like a conveyor belt type system. Um, sometimes we get multiple trucks in at a time because these mines are located um, one of them, the closest one, is probably about 100, 120 miles north of here. Um, so these trucks are literally coming from that mine and just coming down the highway one after the other. You can see this truck um, with just a bed full of sand um, ready to go on the beach. So we can sometimes have multiple trucks coming in at a time. So it's important that this is really organized um, and everybody is cooperating. So that's how we get the sand to the beach from these upland sources. And I have another video, whoops, let's try this one, there we go. So then the sand is dumped, uh, kind of like your old Tonka, cho Tonka toys. <laughs> uh, it's dumped onto the beach and then we spread it out with equipment and we fit it to the profile that we want. Um, so this upland source sand is uh, kind of a lot prettier, um, a lot of our tourists like it better. It's a lot closer to the native sand. It's a lot lighter in color than the gray offshore stuff. Um, and it's also closer in grain size. And so we don't have big chunks of coral and things like that in the sand. Um, and it turns out that it's a lot better for our wildlife too. Um, and lastly, there are less potential impacts to the habitat this way. We don't have those big pipes uh, laying across the beach and, and in the water. So there's less impacts um, to our environment too. Whoops, one more time with the truck. <laughs> there we go. Um, so I do want to show you what one of our recent beach projects did for our shoreline. So um, the photo on the left, um, well, these are both photos of the same location. This is Northeast 14th Street in Fort Lauderdale. So the photo on the left is March of 2016, and that was before our project started. Um, the photo on the right is that same location after uh, construction was complete. And you can see just how much wider the beach is there. Um, we also planted dunes in that area, which add to the resiliency and the stability of the beach. So now that you know a little bit more about our beach management program, let's talk a little bit more about those dunes and why they play such a critical part in the story. So dunes and dune vegetation um, play a really important role in shoreline stabilization. So what they do is they protect the coast from damage from storms, wave energy, and sea level rise. Um, all of these processes can cause erosion, which is bad for our beaches. Um, that would mean uh, basically like the situation we had with Tropical Storm Sandy, where the ocean and the sand would come up and uh, inundate our roads and possibly our infrastructure, our buildings, right? Um, so Dune plants um, and the dunes themselves, they help to trap and anchor the sand um, a lot better than any kind of hard armoring structure. So like seawalls, um, things like that. The, the dunes are a natural way that we can retain that sand um, on the beach where it should be. Um, so 
they make sure that the sand stays where it needs to be. Um, our dunes also create more habitat for animals like seabirds, shorebirds, and sea turtles. Um, speaking of sea turtles, uh, dunes can also enhance the sea turtle habitat by reducing the amount of lighting that reaches the beach um, from the landward side, which is good for sea turtles. And we'll talk about turtles a little bit later. I'm sure you guys maybe tuned into a turtle talk or two with the meek before. Um, but again, the dunes are great for our sea turtles as well. Um, so the primary species of um, plant that grows in the dunes here in Florida is sea oats. And that's what we encourage people to plant on their dunes. Um, so their roots hold on to a lot of that sand and the plants grow really, really quickly. Um, sea oats literally grow like weeds, which is good for our dunes. So I'd like to show you um, just how quickly they do grow and just how good they are at their job. So this is uh, the La Hermitage condominium in Fort Lauderdale. So if you remember that beach project that we did in 2016 in Fort Lauderdale, so this condo was a part of that beach project. Um, so this picture on the left here is February of 2016. It was right when we started placing sand on the beach. And then when it was completed, this is what the beach looked like in front of that condo. And you can see that we planted an additional dune here. The, the property had a dune in front of it, but we wanted to um, give it a little bit more oomph. We wanted it to have a little bit more stability. Um, so we planted additional vegetation in front of there um, to make it a lot more resilient. Um, so this was all well and good. Um, and I wanna show you what it looked like uh, after about a year and a half. Um, so this is September of 2017. You can see just how much those new plantings grew up. And if you can see over here, this is a sea turtle nest in the back corner. So a sea turtle decided that it really liked those dunes a lot and wanted to lay its nest there. Um, so again, great for the wildlife and great for the beach. So if you guys remember back in 2017, if you were in Florida, um, we had something happen in September of 2017. And if no one remembers, I'll give you a hint. Her name was Irma. So Hurricane Irma um, came through in 2017 um, and really tested our dunes. So this is what the beach at the La Hermitage condo looked like after Hurricane Irma passed through. So if you remember, Irma came through right around September 7th, 8th, somewhere in there. Um, so this photo on the right here was taken on September 12th. And you can see that some of the sand was kind of pushed up and on top of those dunes, but they did their job. That's exactly what they're supposed to do. Um, so they protected this building, the condo building that was behind it. They prevented all that sand and all of the uh, storm surge from going any further west, so they did their job. And I do wanna show you what it looked like a few months later. So just a couple months after Hurricane Irma came through, these dunes did exactly what they needed to do. They grew right back up and filled back in perfectly. And that's exactly what the natural ecosystem does. And that's why dunes are so beneficial. Um, so this area definitely um, did a lot better with that dune in front of it um, instead of what it could have happened uh, you know, if the dune wasn't there in the first place. So we were happy to see this example. Okay, so. Broward County does support the planting of dunes on our beaches, and we do that through our Coastal Dune Grant Program. Uh, this program also increases community awareness and participation uh, because some groups do offer volunteer hours for assisting with the plantings, which is pretty cool. Um, so we have multiple grants of up to $5,000 available on a competitive basis to support any dune planting projects in our area. Um, funds can be used to either plant native vegetation or to remove non-native plant vegetation in the area. Um, so you can, you can do either, either uh, action with, with that money. Um, so this is an example of one of our sites. This is Eucalyptus Terrace, as you can see, in Hollywood. Uh, this site was planted in 2019. Um, so they planted some dunes, and this was after about a year of these plantings being in place. Uh, so these plantings grew up really, really nicely. Um, we were really happy with this project. Um, so now this area has a really good buffer against any potential storm surge and sea level rise. So next, I already kind of introduced our sea turtles to you um, with the dunes, but I do want to talk to you briefly about our Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program. So again, 
this is my main responsibility um, at the county is to manage this program. Um, you might have heard a little bit about this program in a different talk hosted by the Meek, um, but I did want to bring it up here since it's also part of our programs. Um, so Broward County is considered um, what they call a medium density nesting beach. And that just means that we get about two to 3,000 nests on our beaches per year. Um, so we have 24 miles of coastline that, that our program monitors. Um, and so compared to other beaches in the county, we're just kind of medium density, which is right in the middle, which is still pretty good. We still get lots of turtles here. Um, our program has been monitoring the beaches of Broward County for sea turtle nests since 1978. So our data set is one of the longest running in the entire state. Um, so we currently contract Nova Southeastern University. Uh, they're also our partners at the Meek. Um, so we're all really closely uh, intertwined here with turtles. Um, so Nova conducts our daily nesting surveys for us um, during sea turtle nesting season, which is March 1st through October 31st every single year. Uh, the program also conducts uh, lighting surveys every month to ensure that the coastal properties minimize the amount of artificial lighting that's reaching the beach. Uh, and lastly, the program also conducts outreach in the community to educate our residents and visitors all about our sea turtles. So this graph uh, gives you a good idea of what our sea turtle nesting has looked like over the life of the program. Um, you can see that the nesting numbers have steadily increased here from the 80s. Um, all the way up through the 90s. Uh, and, you know, today we've been seeing some record-breaking nesting seasons um, in the past few years. Um, some of our numbers have been crazy high recently, and our team has been exhausted just keeping up with all these turtles. Um, but it's really great news for our program. Um, we think that this increase in the amount of nesting is largely due to local and federal protective measures that have been in place now for almost 50 years. Um, because sea turtles are really long-lived marine reptiles, um, they don't actually reproduce until they're 20, 25, sometimes 30 years old. So because of this, it's hard to see any of those protective measures and what they're doing until way, way into the future. Um, so we think that's why we're just now starting to see increases is because of those conservation measures that were put in place back in the 70s. Um, but still really good news for our program. We're really happy about it. Um, so to further support our local sea turtle population and to help them thrive, uh, the county does encourage all residents and business owners to incorporate sea turtle friendly lighting on their beachfront properties. Um, so you may have heard about this type of lighting in another talk that the Meek hosted a couple weeks ago, um, but I did want to touch on it now today just in case you missed that other talk. Um, so sea turtle friendly lighting is made up of three golden rules is, is kind of what we refer to them as. Um, the first one is to keep lights low. And this means to mount them low to the ground and also to keep the amount of light as low as possible to achieve the task. So you can see um, this little bollard light here is nice and low to the ground because that's where we want the light to go is on the ground. We don't need the light to go up into the sky because we don't need to light anything that's, that's up in that direction. We want it on the ground. Um, so the next golden rule of sea turtle friendly lighting is to keep it shielded. And if you look at this canister fixture up here, you'll see that you can't see the, the light bulb in it. And that means that this light is really, really well shielded. Um, we wanna make sure that the light is also facing down. Um, so that goes into shielding as well um, because we want the light again down where we want it. Uh, lastly, the third criteria is to keep it long. And this refers to the wavelength of light. And really amber, red, orange, all of those colors are great for turtle friendly lighting because the turtles pretty much ignore those colors. Um, they can still see them, uh, but they're just not as sensitive to them as they are to a white light or maybe a blue light or green light. Um, so the red, amber, and orange are much, much better. Um, so lastly, another benefit of this type of lighting, this turtle-friendly lighting, is that it's not just friendly to sea turtles. It's also friendly uh, to things like insects, bats, birds, and even humans. Um, this type of light is a lot better for all of these animals. Um, it's better for humans because it helps us sleep better at night. Um, we're learning more and more about human behavior and how it relates to lighting. And basically what we're learning 
is that the more um, really bright, intense white light that we're exposed to, and particularly um, the blue light that's in a lot of things like our TVs and our phones and our computer screens is really not great for humans. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at doing some lighting work around your house um, or, you know, anywhere, maybe consider some wildlife friendly lighting instead, which is the same as turtle friendly lighting. So it's good for all kinds of critters, not just turtles. All right, so now we're going to move off the beach and into the water to talk about some of our marine programs next. So the Broward County Beach and Marine section supports coral reef monitoring efforts in a lot of different ways. Um, so in case you're not familiar with our reef tract, um, the reefs offshore of Broward County are part of the Florida Reef Tract, which runs from the Dry Tortugas all the way up to St. Lucie. So it's a really long stretch of reef and we want to make sure that it's healthy and taken care of. Um, our reefs are home to things like corals, invertebrates like crabs, um, algae, fish, other vertebrates like sharks and sea turtles. Um, lots and lots of things rely on coral reefs. Um, not only are our reefs important ecosystems in themselves because they, again, host a lot of different animals. Um, we get a lot of our food sources from reefs, um, so like fish and things like that. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that our reefs are also our first defense against storms and hurricanes. So before those storms actually reach our shore um, and before they reach the beaches, they have to go through the reefs and having a well-developed reef system can actually buffer a lot of that storm energy before it even reaches the beach. Um, so that's another reason why we need to keep our reefs healthy. So to help protect this vital habitat, um, our group participates in things like annual coral surveys. We also assist with coral bleaching and disease monitoring with um, quite a few different organizations that are listed there. Um, we've helped out the Smithsonian Institute. We also help a few of the groups at Nova Southeastern University with their uh, disease research and also Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, additionally, we assist the Florida Department of Environmental Protection with vessel grounding and anchor damage assessments. So in case um, either a small or a large boat were to um, run aground on a reef offshore of Broward or if they accidentally through anchor and then dragged it and damaged any of our reefs, we help um, DEP to assess that area um, to see what kind of damage was done. And then we help them figure out how to mitigate for that damage. Um, so to further protect our offshore reef reefs um, from damage, we also maintain a series of mooring buoys offshore. Um, the buoys allow boaters to tie off to them instead of throwing anchor onto the reef. Um, they're completely free to boaters. Um, so if you're boating along offshore of Broward County and you see one of our mooring buoys, you are more than welcome to tie up to it. No one's gonna ask you for any money for doing it. We don't have meters. Like if you're parking your car at a, at a park or anything like that, they're completely free. Um, they are meant for vessels that are up to 60 feet. So kind of like small to medium sized boats and they're meant for use in relatively calm water. You don't wanna to be tied to a mooring buoy in really rough water because you'd be bouncing all around. You could do damage to your boat and you could also damage the buoy. So that's not really good. Um, but we do have buoys all over the place in Broward. We've got them um, off of Deerfield Beach, um, just south of the pier up there. We have them in Pompano Beach, both north and south of the pier. In Lauderdale by the Sea in Fort Lauderdale, there's a series of buoys near the commercial pier. And we also have buoys offshore of Dania Beach, just south of Port Everglades at Barracuda Reef, if you've been out that way. So the buoy system itself, this is a diagram of what it looks like. So essentially they're anchored into the substrate like this. So they're nice and strong, um, you know, nice and strong to hold your vessel again in calm water. Uh, there, this um, anchor at the bottom is attached to a downline, which goes up to the surface. And then this downline is attached to our buoy at the surface, which is what you would see. It's a bright white buoy um, with a blue stripe on it. It's really easy to see, um, even more easy to see because we've got a series of them in a row. And so you won't just see one random mooring buoy offshore of Broward. If you do, it's not a mooring buoy. <laughs> it might, might be one that came loose or something, but these are in a series of lines. And so there's anywhere from probably like five to 25 of them in a line. Um, so the buoy is nice, bright white so that you can see it. 
And then attached to the buoy itself is this pickup line here. And that's what you'll see floating at the surface of the water. Um, and that's how you uh, tie to it. So speaking of tying, it's really important that, um, that boats tie safely to the mooring buoys to not only avoid damage to their boat, but also avoid damage to the buoy itself. Um, so to properly tie, it's best to use a bow line um, that passes through the eye in this pickup line. So let's back up a little bit here. So this is your mooring buoy, and that's what you'll see when you drive up on it on your boat. This yellow line is that pickup line. Um, some of them are yellow, some of them are white, but this one in here is yellow. Um, so you have your bow line, um, you tie, um, you tie off onto a cleat, you feed it through here, just kind of like a needle and thread, and then you tie it off to another cleat on your boat. So you're kind of making like a triangle with your bow line. Um, we don't want you to tie up like this picture on the right, which unfortunately we see quite a bit out there. Um, this could do damage to your boat, this could damage the, the mooring. Um, so we don't want you to tie them directly to your boat. This is not safe um, and we don't want anybody to get hurt. Um, so if you have a boat or you know somebody with a boat, we do have more, um, more information about our mooring buoys on our website, including a step-by-step -step guide and more pictures of how to safely tie um, to the buoys. And we also have GPS locations if you find those helpful. Those are listed on our website. I'll give you the website at the end, don't worry. <laughs> um, so we also have an active artificial reef program at the county. So artificial reefs are important because they create new habitat for marine life. Um, they also attract scuba divers and increase tourism in our area. And if needed, they can also be used for mitigation purposes. Um, so say we have a beach project and we anticipate that you know, some impacts are gonna happen to our offshore reefs resources. We can then build an artificial reef instead and deploy it somewhere else to offset those, um, those impacts that would happen. Um, so artificial reefs are really important for us. Um, so our program has been deploying artificial reefs in the county since 1970. So we've had this program for quite some time. Um, we've deployed all different kinds of artificial reefs from vessels like boats, um, concrete modules, um, fancy, more artistic concrete modules, um, reef balls, and so many other things. Um, we've deployed over 200 artificial reefs to date, um, which is really awesome. I'm really proud of that. Um, so now let's put on our masks and fins and let's go for a little virtual swim to see some of the vessels that have been deployed as part of our program. Let's see if I can get this going. Here we go. So the first one that we're on here is the Guy Harvey. Um, this is an 185 foot freighter and it's offshore of Pompano. Uh, the J Scuddy is next. This is offshore of Fort Lauderdale and it's a 97 foot tugboat. It was sunk in 1986 at 70 feet of, uh, in 70 feet of water. This is the Mercy Jesus. It's also offshore of Fort Lauderdale. It's a 90 foot freighter and it was sunk in 1998 at 72 feet. Um, so you can see all the growth on, um, on the Mercy Jesus. Uh, so it's been down there for a couple decades now and you can see just how much stuff is growing on it. Um, you can see all these fish that are down there that have really made this wreck home. Um, you can see all the corals growing on it, some algae, um, sponges, lots of really cool stuff going on there. This is the Ken Vitale. It's also offshore of Fort Lauderdale. It's a 131 foot freighter. This was sunk in 1999. And coming up, we have, there it is. We have um, some wrecks that are down in Hollywood, including the Captain Didi, a concrete sailboat, the McAllister, which is a tugboat. We have the Ebenezer, uh, which is an 85 foot freighter. We also have the Michelin, uh, also offshore of Hollywood. It's a 32-foot sailboat. The Emmy Boggs is also in Hollywood. That's a 55-foot barge. And so you can see all the growth on these as well. And lastly, we have this acoustic array um, offshore of Hollywood. This was a series of concrete and steel arrays that was, they were all sunk in 1993 at 74 feet. Um, so again, see all the wildlife and all the stuff growing on them. So these reefs are really important to 
um, create more habitat for, um, for fish and other marine life. Um, so a really important part of, of what we do as well. Whoops, unless you guys want to watch it again. <laughs> See if we can go, there we go. So let's dry off now and finally talk about Broward County's manatee program. Um, so Broward County has a manatee protection plan, which was created in 1989 after the state directed um, 13 key manatee counties in Florida, mostly on the East Coast, um, to prepare protection plans to protect these gentle giants. Um, so among lots of paper pushing, um, there's really three components uh, that, that we're responsible for um, that are ongoing in the effort to protect our manatees in Broward. Um, so our manatee managers conduct survey flights during peak manatee season, uh, which is November 15th through March 31st. And if you have trouble remembering it, I just remember that it's opposite of sea turtle season pretty much. Um, so all year long, it's either manatees or sea turtles in Broward County. If it's summertime, really, then it's turtles. If it's wintertime, then it's manatees. That's how I remember it. Um, so we conduct these survey flights to see how many manatees are swimming around in our waters in Broward County. Um, we also keep track of how many boat slips are permitted in the county. Um, and a fee from those boat slips actually goes back into our manatee protection program to further the conservation efforts, which is pretty cool. Um, and lastly, our team conducts education and outreach in the community uh, to inform residents and mainly boaters about these gentle giants. Um, so these manatees are really susceptible to boat strikes. And so we really want to educate the boating community that these guys are out there um, so that they don't accidentally hit a manatee. So we want them to abide by the speed zones. We want them to keep a lookout because these little guys, big guys rather, um, could really pop up anywhere. Um, anywhere where there's water, there could be a manatee in there. So we want to make sure people are being careful. So fasten your seatbelts, uh, put on your headsets if they're not already on. And let's go on a virtual manatee survey flight from a helicopter. Here we go. So this, uh, this is one of our um, section members conducting the manatee survey. Um, this is the Dania Pier that they're flying over right now. Um, so they cruise by in a helicopter. Um, they go through, uh, they go up the intercoastal waterway. They also check out the ocean because there could be manatees in the ocean. Um, and then they go through any of the canals in Broward. Now, obviously, they don't have time to go through every single canal because that survey flight would be so long. I would need so many snacks in that helicopter to do that long of a survey flight. Um, but they do have a specific pattern that they follow. Um, and mainly, they focus on areas where they know that there's going to be lots of manatees. Um, so we try to count as we go on the helicopter. Whoops. Um, but sometimes there's just so many manatees in some of these places that we just cannot count them while sitting up there in the helicopter. Um, so this is the FPL, the Florida Power and Light um, Cooling Lake, uh, and it's just west of the airport. And so to give you a better idea of how this picture was taken and what was going on and why we can't sit there and count the manatees, aside from the fact that there's just so many, <laughs> um, we were probably getting yelled at by air traffic control when this picture was taken. They were probably telling us to get out of the way because they had a big commercial airplane coming in with 500 people on it. So, um, so we have to do some of these areas pretty quickly. And so um, our biologists will take photos from above and then they'll look at them on their computer screen and then they'll count the little manatees. Um, so sometimes we play a game and we send each other the pictures and we say, well, how many do you count in this picture? Um, it's kind of like guessing how many jelly beans are in a jar. Um, so another caveat to this is that conditions are sometimes not so great. So you can see some manatees that are um, further underwater than other ones. So the ones closer to the surface are easier to count than, than the ones that are a little bit deeper. Um, so conditions of the water can also affect our count. Um, so we have to take these photos to kind of um, get a better idea of, of how many manatees there are. Um, so again, this was at one of the, um, the cooling lakes. And so basically it's a cooling lake for the power plant. So the water is actually warm. So manatees are um, warm blooded mammals, just like we are. So they can't stay in cold water for too long. Otherwise they could get sick. Um, so they gather at these warm water refuges um, to stay nice and warm during the winter. 
Um, and we, we know where those are and that's where we find the manatees. Um, so we report these manatee counts to the state um, from these survey flights. We report any maybe injured animals that we see. Um, and so all of that data gets sent to the state. So you can get involved too. Um, we've developed a mobile app to get even more data about manatees in Broward County. It's called the I Spy a Manatee mobile app. You can download it for your Apple or Android phone. Um, if you just search I Spy a Manatee, it should come up. Um, you can report a manatee sighting. So if you're um, out on the beach or maybe along the intercoastal somewhere and you see a manatee, um, you can open up the app and it will ask you what the manatee was doing, if it was eating, if it was resting, um, if you allow your, um, the phone to look at your location, it will take a GPS location of where you are. Um, and if you report that the manatee is injured or no longer alive, the app will also prompt you to call Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission so that you can report it to them and they'll send a biologist to come out and, and check things out. And if the manatee's injured, then they'll assemble their team and um, do everything they can to, to rescue the manatee to get it some help. Um, so these data are also really important. Um, and sometimes really cool, you can also take a picture of the manatee. And so we get some really great photos um, from the app as well. Um, so we love seeing your photos. So check it out, download it if you're interested and uh, send us some manatee pictures. Um, so I hope my presentation today helped you better understand how our oceans, our beaches and everything in between are connected. Um, so our beach and marine section also connects all of our programs by hosting the annual coastal cleanup event. Um, this year, we're doing things a little bit differently. Um, so instead of coming to a designated site in September, which is usually how we run things, you can participate anytime between September 1st and December 31st this year. Um, you can clean up any area too. You don't have to necessarily go to the beach unless you want to. I like the beach. Um, but you can clean up any area. If you want to clean up your neighborhood, that's cool. If you um, do want to go to the beach, that's cool too. Um, so you can anywhere you're collecting garbage, um, collect that data and then report it on the Clean Swell app. Um, so the Clean Swell app was designed by um, the real hosts of the Coastal Cleanup, which is the Ocean Conservancy. They're the bigger organization that runs this thing um, all over the world. Um, so the Clean Swell app is connected to them. Um, so you can tally all the trash that you collect. And so you, if you collect um, plastic bags, if you collect um, you know, cigarette butts or anything like that, you tally what you collect and then you can upload your data through the app and then it will get tallied um, with all of the international data, um, which is really cool and really important. So um, check it out, download the Clean, Clean Swell app and, you know, get cleaning. I'll probably go out this weekend and uh, collect some trash in my neighborhood too. Um, so for more program updates, if you guys are more interested in our Beach and Marine um, section, you can follow us on social media. So we post um, program updates like hashtag Manatee Monday. We also post for hashtag Turtle Tuesday. Um, so you can find us at Broward Environment on Facebook. We are at Broward ENV on Twitter. Um, so if you are interested in other things besides Beach and Marine, um, we do share those two pages with our other um, programs. So like our Nature Skate program posts stuff on there. We have a water conservation team, our air quality and outreach group, and our energy and sustainability team also give us content on there. Um, so you'll get all kinds of natural resources information off of those pages. Um, you can also follow us, um, subscribe to our channel rather, on YouTube. Um, we are Broward Environment, um, and we try to post um, relevant videos. Um, lately, we've been, um, we've had a series called Storytime with a Scientist, uh, where we read different books about different scientific subjects with you. Um, so you can also check out our YouTube page. So I do thank you so much for your attention this afternoon. And thank you again to the Meek for hosting this awesome webinar series. Um, you can visit our website for more info. I know I plugged it earlier, but in case you're wondering, it is broward.org slash natural resources slash beach and marine. I know it's kind of long, um, but you could probably find us on Google as well. Um, so I want to leave you with another cool video. Um, even though we don't have a formal dolphin monitoring program at the county, sometimes we do see these playful critters out there when we're doing other work. Um, and this was a pod of Atlantic spotted dolphins that our team 
saw um, last year offshore. This was just offshore Broward. Um, and they were super playful and it's really fun to see them swimming in front of our bow. Um, they play in our wake behind us um, and it's really fun to see them. I'm also really happy that my colleague didn't drop his phone when he took this video because he was on the bow of our boat and holding his phone over, um, over the bow taking the video. So I'm really happy he didn't drop his phone because I probably wouldn't have believed him that he, that they saw all these dolphins in such a playful mood that day, but um, super cool stuff. So again, thank you guys so much. Um, if you have questions, I'm gonna check out the chat right now. Let's pause my video here so you guys don't get seasick. <laughs> Um, so let me check the chat to see if there were questions. Okay, let's see. Oh, wow, lots of questions. Okay. Hey, Kiefer, I just saw your hi message on the, on the chat here. Okay, so Greg asks, how do you balance beach sand replenishment with the sand that flows off the beach and smothers the coral reefs? Okay, so Greg, really great question. So when we do our beach projects, we do our best to stay within state permitted guidelines um, for things like turbidity. So all that, any kind of sand that washes out of our beach project area that goes into the ocean, we have very specific permit requirements um, for how much of that is allowed to go into the water. And if there's too much going on, we have to stop the construction immediately. So that's one way that we kind of control for that. Um, and then the other way, like I said, is through the, um, through the mitigation reef. So with any project, the state kind of assumes that we have um, a certain amount of impact that's going to happen to the hard bottom. Um, so because of that, we implement things like artificial reefs um, to offset that. And it's not a one for one. It's actually more. We have to do more mitigation than any potential damage that we're going to do. So that's how we balance it out. That's kind of two quick ways. Thanks for your question. Uh, Kiefer asks, how much of percentage coral reef could save lands from hurricanes? That's a really good question, Kiefer. Um, I don't have an exact percentage off the top of my head, but I'll have to look that one up and maybe get back to you. Um, but it also just depends on how healthy the reef is. Like I said, if you have a really well-developed um, reef offshore, um, then it's going to protect you more than a reef that's maybe had a lot of damage to it or doesn't have, um, you know, as much built up to it. Um, so it, it really depends on how, how developed the reef is. But as far as a percentage, I'm gonna have to look that one up and get back to you, okay? Um, yep, Kiefer, I know you guys go to International Clean Coastal Cleanup every year. We see you guys at the sites and we thank you for joining us for that. Um, we love seeing you guys. And also congratulations on being our Broward County Water Whiz hero. Um, I saw that you won our Conservation Pays um, contest for that. So I know that you're really involved in the community and we really appreciate everything that you're doing for us. Okay, Sydney asks, since sea turtles seem to be picking, picking about their nest locations, have you noticed any increase or decrease in nests on beaches that have imported sand? Okay, so Sydney, I think you meant that they seem to be picky about their nesting locations and you're kind of right. So. Sea turtles sometimes come up on the beaches and they don't like the area for whatever reason. Maybe they don't like the sand, maybe there's too much light, uh, maybe somebody disturbed them when they were nesting. Um, so we have looked at what the turtles do on beaches that have, um, you know, the upland source sand versus offshore sand versus native sand. Um, and like I kind of touched on earlier, um, we've noticed that there's less, um, there's less successful nesting on beaches that have that offshore sand, but we've noticed pretty similar nesting um, on the upland source sand versus native sand, which is really great news for us um, because for a while beach nourishment was really thought of as being pretty bad for turtles for a couple years after it was done and then the turtles slowly started coming back to the area to nest. Um, but with this upland source sand, we, we didn't really see a big difference um, in our most recent beach project in um, Fort Lauderdale in 2016, we saw pretty similar um, nesting success for the turtles. So that was really good news. Um, but it's definitely something that we keep an eye on and definitely something that we, that we look for. Great question. Uh, Taylor, thank you for your question. Do you take volunteers for any of these programs? Um, so right now it is 
difficult for us to take volunteers, um, but I know you guys take volunteers at the Carpenter House. Um, so if anyone's interested in sea turtles and conservation like that, um, maybe you guys can help them out with um, volunteering at the Carpenter House. Um, but for us at the county, unfortunately, we don't take volunteers. Um, but again, if you maybe chat with um, some of the nonprofit organizations that are around who help with um, some of the dune plantings. I know the Youth Environmental Alliance is one of them. Um, so the Youth Environmental Alliance, sometimes they actually apply for a lot of our dune grant programs for different properties on the beaches. And then they look for volunteers to help with the plantings. Um, so that would be a good organization to contact if you guys are looking for volunteer hours. Um, so yeah, really good question. Um, S. Jarvis asks, what tricks do you have to help with seasickness or air sickness in the helicopter? So unfortunately, I do suffer from um, motion sickness, both on the boat and in the helicopter. Um, but I think um, my, my best uh, method is to um, remain calm, <laughs> remind myself that it's going to pass. Um, and really just looking to the horizon when you're on the boat is a good tip. Um, you know, taking any kind of over-the-counter um, seasickness medication can also help. Um, ginger is also really helpful. Um, so you can take ginger capsules or maybe have a ginger ale handy if you're, if you're out on the boat, a nice cold ginger ale. It actually sounds really delicious right now, <laughs> and I'm not even seasick. Um, but ginger is also a really good remedy. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think just um, mind over matter, I think, is another really good one, too. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Um, Kiefer, dune restoration is conducting all over County Beach Line. If so, any missing spots we could try harder in those areas? Yeah, so Kiefer, that's a really great question. So I'll have to go back and double check the maps, um, but there are some spots in the county that have um, fewer dunes than other spots. Um, so the county is trying to connect with those properties either through the cities um, or directly reaching out to the properties to get them to plant more dunes. Um, I think though at last estimate we have about 70% of our coastline has dunes and 30% does not have dunes. Um, so I mean that's a pretty good number. We'd like it to be higher. We'd like to have more dune cover on our on our beaches again for that um, resiliency and for protection from storm surge and sea level rise and things like that. So we're doing what we can, um, but if you guys are out there or if you guys are at any other, um, you know, outreach events or anything, and if you see somebody from a city, I mean, just start talking to them about dunes. Ask them if they have dunes, and if they don't, then maybe share some of the info that you learned today um, about, about our dune program and tell them that we can help them and, and hopefully, um, you know, plant some dunes in their area. Um, but I think 70% is a pretty good starting point, um, but hopefully through time we can get some more folks to plant more dunes. Yeah, great question. I don't see any other questions in the chat, um, so I think I will pass it back on over to Taylor at this point. If I missed any questions, Taylor, did I miss any questions? I don't believe so, but if you do have questions that you think of later or you didn't have a chance to put in, feel free to email us at meek, M-E-E-C, at nova.edu. And if we can't answer it, we will pass them on to Stephanie. Um, otherwise, thank you so much, Stephanie. That was an awesome presentation. Learned so You're much welcome. in the area. Oh, that's a very cool drawing, Sydney. Look at that shark and that turtle. Very nice. Oh, I um, well, thank you guys for coming today. If you missed the beginning, uh, it is recorded. We are going to slowly but surely edit it and put it onto our YouTube channel. So feel free to catch up there. Otherwise, uh, today is Thursday. So next Tuesday um, at 1 p.m., we are going to be ha hosting Nicholas Farmer. Um, he's going to teach us all about the endangered sperm whale, which is really cool. We haven't done a lot of marine mammals just yet. So this will be really exciting. Um, we do post all of our scheduling on our social medias, um, so check us out there. And if you have been coming to these programs and you've enjoyed what we do, it is free programming. We want to make sure we are offering really cool resources to people stuck at home. Um, but we did just start our crowdfunding campaign. Um, we are posting that to all of our social medias. It is predominantly for us to be able to uh, create some really cool resources for people to take out with them. 
um, since the school year looks like it's going to be a little unusual. We know that a lot of people can't be coming to the MEEC um, and having our usual hands on programming, but we want to make sure that things are still really engaging, really fun and hands on for people. So we are creating new programs that can be taken home um, or taken to school and you could still learn more about the ocean that way. Stuff. Sorry, what? You're scaring the dogs, honey. Go on. Oop, I think someone got unmuted. That's fine. Um, so if you have a chance and you've been enjoying these programs, please check out our crowdfunding campaign. It's all over our socials. Um, otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming today. And thank you so much, Stephanie. It was awesome. Thanks for hosting. That was fun. <laughs> Stay safe, guys. Have